delighted to welcome you to today's session in our series on the ethics of healthcare reform. So this preview next Wednesday, uh, David Song from the Department of Surgery will be speaking about the future of surgery under the ACA. It should be a great session. But today we have, uh, it's been my great pleasure to introduce Karen Kim, who is a professor of medicine in the session of gastroenterology here at the University of Chicago, as well as over the past three months or so, she uh, has been appointed to be the Dean for Faculty Affairs, looking at the well-being of a variety of issues with faculty here in the bi Biological Sciences Division. Uh, Karen has a long-standing history with the University of Chicago, where she was actually born here uh, at the University of Chicago and grew up in Chicago, and really uh, was introduced at a very early stage to the issues of immigrant and uh, a diverse population. Uh, she's a Korean background, and her mother and her family as a whole have been a very active in the Korean community, and that sort of rubbed off on Karen, and she has really become, uh, both locally as well as nationally, one of the leaders in a variety of issues of diversity, including Asian American health as well as women's health. Uh, she currently is the, the president of the Asian Health Coalition of Illinois, as well as uh, leadership positions in a number of the national Asian American health groups also. And she still is uh, completing her term now, uh, she has a five-year term uh, at, at the uh, Office of uh, uh, Women's Health at, the, at NIH, really sort of a prestigious position. Uh, Karen also uh, directs the Community Engagement and Disparities Corps within the University of Chicago's Comprehensive Cancer Center and does a variety of work that basically involves on including hepatitis B here, colorectal cancer screening, community-based participatory research, and has two large center grants. Uh, one is the NIH grant, which is a partnership with Chicago State University looking to improve uh, the education of both Chicago State uh, students as well as our students here at Christopher School of Medicine on a variety of public health, community health issues as well as a center grant from ARC, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, looking at trying to improve cold record cancer screening in the Asian American population. Just one more story about Karen, that, um, you know, so the Asian American population is very diverse, as, as Karen will tell you, and she's done a remarkable job of bringing together just about every one of the Asian American uh, ethnic populations in, in Chicago. And this is a really hard thing to do for a variety of reasons, so Karen has been masterful. Uh, at, at the leadership of that effort. I would also mention too that uh, Karen, I mean, sort of like her bio, but like on a personal level, she really is a tremendous leader. Um, works wonderfully with students, uh, was named to be a member of the uh, Academy of, of Middle Educators by Pritzker, uh, and just a uh, true leader to cultural competency and uh, helping our students work together with diverse populations. So today, Karen will be speaking about the immigrants. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marshall. So again, thank you, Marshall. It's really a pleasure to be able to present today. Um, I thought today I would start with um, a little bit about um, immigrants. What, are, what is the definition of immigrants? Who are immigrants? And how do, are they impacted by the Affordable Care Act? And then I want to talk a little bit about this, a subgroup um, that are limited to English proficient populations um, and that population's relationship to the Affordable Care Act. I'm going to end with a case study looking at the Asian American population as sort of a model population that has both large number of immigrants as well as limited um, English proficient populations. And then to bring it really to home and talk about what we're doing on our own campus. So first of all, how do you become a US citizen? And so there's four ways to become a US citizen. You can be born in the United States, which is the, by far the majority. You can be born to a citizen, um, US citizen parent or your parent became a citizen before they turned 18, you were adopted by a US citizen, or you were naturalized over time. If you're in the United States and you're not a citizen, then you're either an immigrant or a non-immigrant. And I'll talk first about non-immigrants. So when we think about non-immigrants, we're talking about people who are in the United States with no intention, at least when they come in, of staying here forever. And those tend to be students, those with temporary uh, workers, visitors, or others who are in the US temporarily, temporarily when their visas only allow them to stay for a, a very limited amount of time. In terms of immigrants, there's two categories. So you are either a lawfully pre present resident, which I'm going to abbreviate as LPR, and those include people who have green cards, 
um, refugees and asylees, those individuals who may be escaping to the United States based on persecution based on religion, race, political opinion, nationality, or groups. For people who are seeking asylum, those are people who are already in the United States and they feel that going back to their home country will cause them harm and they can apply to see if they can stay in the United States. Those groups are all lawfully present in the United States. And then we have a second category of immigrants that are called undocumented. We used to call these illegal aliens, which I find is a term that's very off-putting. And those can be people who have papers, were here legally, but then their papers expired, or those who entered the United States with a, um, a visa or a green card, and again, um, with a green card, you without a green card. For those who have green cards under the lawfully president present residents, those, those individuals need to renew every 10 years if they don't become a citizen. So there's two really, two big groups of immigrants. In terms of what is the magnitude of this population in the U.S., this is from 2011 data. Overall, immigrants make up about 13% of the U.S. population, or 40 million, who are foreign born in the United States. Of those 40 million, about 15 million are naturalized U.S. citizens, so they have equal rights. About 13 million are these legally present um, residents. Over 50% of those are uninsured. And about 11 million are undocumented. What about immigrants in Illinois? So there's about 1.7 um, immigrants in, the, in Illinois that makes up about 13% of our population, so about one in, a little over one in 10. About half are naturalized citizens, and about almost a million are either legally present residents or undocumented. And about half a million of the immigrants in, the, in Illinois are uninsured, which makes up about 30% of those that are uninsured currently. About 48% or about 250,000 of those individuals will become eligible under the Affordable Care Act. So this is a very large population of immigrants that will be um, eligible. In terms of who are the immigrants, about 40, about, sorry, 74% are Latino, about 11% Asian, and about 15% um, white, so people from, often from European countries. In terms of undocumented immigrants, this is a very, very large group, about, makes up about 3 point, about 4% of the U.S. population. 60% are from Mexico, about 2% are from China and the Philippines. In Illinois, we have about a half million undocumented immigrants. So what is the, why is this important? I think it's important when we think about access to care in terms of um, will you have, um, will you be eligible under the Affordable Care Act? And so this graph shows three different populations, US citizens, legal, permanent residents, and undocumented. So basically, if you are a citizen of the United States, you are subject to individual mandates under Affordable Care Act. You are eligible for Medicaid, depending on your income level related to um, federal po the pe federal poverty line. You have access to the, uh, the health exchange, and you may be eligible for premium tax credits under the Affordable Ca Care Act. Those are for people who are US citizens. For those who are here legally, you are also subject to individual mandates. And you are eligible for Medicaid as long as you have been living in the United States for five years. You have access to the marketplace, and you may be eligible for tax, um, tax credit. If you are un an undocumented, you, have, you are not subject to individual mandates. You are not eligible for Medicaid. You have no access to the marketplace. And you, of course, do not get any tax break. You are able, though, to use any emergency services. And you certainly are able to go to uh, places like community health centers or federally qualified health centers that will, t that, um, that will uh, be willing to see you. So this is a population that is really um, challenged under the Affordable Care Act. I'm going to switch over now and talk about uh, the, another population that is very closely linked with being an immigrant, and that is the ling limited English proficient population. That is individuals who do not speak English as their primary language and have a limited ability to read, speak, write, or understand English. U.S. Census defines this as a person who speaks another language other than English at home and does not speak English well or not at all. So let's talk about how big this population is in the United States. More than 60 million individuals speak a language other than English at home. That's 21% of the US population. 
And what the U.S. Census in their reporting, what they found was that of this 60 million, about 59% of those 60 million actually speak English very well. And so they would not be considered limited English proficient. However, about 25 million people fit under the category of limited English proficiency. I always know that there's somebody in clinic who has uh, inability to speak English because I can hear my resident screaming at them down the hall because certainly if they don't understand English, they must be deaf. Anyway, um, and their tendency is to be screaming as if somehow that's going to make people understand. Um, about 80% of limited English populations are foreign born. And when we think about the magnitude, one out of four people who will be entering the health exchange marketplace will be in this category. So I have to ask ourselves, is the health system ready and will access be enough? Illinois has the fifth largest limited English proficient population. 2.6 million people speak a non-English language at home and about 1.2 million are limited English proficient. And there were studies that, are, that have been done in Chicago looking at this population to understand what are some of the barriers to access to care. This was a focus group done among limited English proficient immigrants in Chicago. And they found that 40% thought that the top barrier to access was care was not insurance, but was the inability to access care due to language. And this is a really huge, overwhelming concern for this population. About 15% also had problems submitting necessary paperwork. So again, limited English proficient is not just about the ability to speak the English language, but it's about the ability to read it proficiently and write as well. And if you think again about the United States in 2009, this is um, us in Illinois, where a um, little bit under 10% of our population fits this category. And if you break it down a little bit further based on county and region, you can see that there are areas, this light purple area is 9.7 to 23% limited English proficient, and this is less than 50%. And you can see in Illinois, we have large pockets of individuals who are limited English proficient. If you look at the coastal regions, certainly in California, there, there are, again, huge numbers. 44% of California ha have limited English populations. But they have a very different, robust infrastructure to address some of those needs because of the larger concentration of individuals that speak non-English languages. I would say that in Illinois, our safety, um, within our safety net system, we have one major safety net healthcare system, and within that system, there is one, currently one FQHC, um, Asian Human Services, that is really geared towards seeing um, Asian uh, populations, and those are largely South Asian. There has been approval for one, a second FQHC to be open. Hamdar Center will open the second FQHC that really can address the, the language needs um, and health access needs of non-English speakers who are um, Asian American. There are numerous studies that look at the effect of language on the healthcare encounter. Certainly we know that those who don't speak English well are less satisfied with their health care, have problems with accessing care, have in probably less uh, utilization of the health care, quality of care suffers, costs go up, and interventions also go up, unnecessary interventions. This is a study that was published by um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and they asked in the course of the past year, how many times were you sick but decided not to visit a doctor because the doctor didn't speak Spanish or have an interpreter? And you can see that one in five sought not to seek out care because of the inability to speak to their doctor. This is looking at limited English proficient populations in cancer screening for pap smear, mammography, and colorectal cancer screening. And you can see there is an enormous difference in utilization of cancer screening when you don't speak English. And this is perhaps one of my, my favorite studies that kind of sums this up. This was a study that was looking at a, an emergency room in um, New York City. They looked at 4,000 consecutive visits, and, basic, and they looked at whether you were a bilingual speaker, speaker, you use an interpreter, and if you didn't use an interpreter. And what you can see here is that if you didn't use an interpreter and you were talking to somebody who didn't speak English, you were twice as likely to do testing you were more likely to admit the patient because if you can't speak to them, you can't figure out what's wrong, you admit them. Actually, you spent more money and you spent less time. So this is a real problem and this kind of sums up what happens when you're with individuals who don't speak your language. 
This is a study that we're publishing right now that looks at race and ethnicity concordance in terms of colorectal cancer screening, looking at a race and ethnic concordance among a limited English Korean cohort. And you can see that if you're a Caucasian, and this is looking at FOB, uh, fecal occult blood testing return versus un, not return, not return versus return, and you can see that if you compare the Caucasian physician versus the Korean physician, the Korean physician did much, much better in terms of getting FOBT um, results returned. If you looked at language concordance, this is a physician with an interpreter, and this is a Korean speaking physician. And again, similar to other uh, data, you can see that there was by far a preference for people to be returning their FOBT cards in, uh, by being prompted by somebody who either was Korean among the Korean cohort or spoke the language. So we know that there is not only quality of care issues, but there is um, compliance issues and adherence issues that come along with being able to speak the same language. Um, in terms of language requirements under the Affordable Care Act, certainly even prior to the Affordable Care Act, um, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act as well as Executive Order 13166 by President Clinton said that we could not discriminate on the basis of language, race, ethnicity, religion. And so these have already been in place. And for anybody who receives any federal funds, it is required that we provide language access to those with limited English proficiency. But under the Affordable Care Act, there's also many, many policies that have been put in place. There's non-discrimination requirement, plain language requirement, and culturally and linguistically appropriate requirements that all suggest that we need to provide language access for limited English proficient patients. But there are some thresholds. So that threshold under Affordable Care Act in 2012, the federal regulations adopted a threshold of 10% or more of the population living in the consumer's county are literate only in the same non-English language for language services. And a 10 percent threshold leaves out millions of individuals to have a access to care under the Affordable Care Act. And so there has been a lot of policy discussion about changing this threshold to, because um, under this threshold only 23 states will have counties that have a representative sample of people that are 10 percent speaking the same language where ACA kicks in in terms of mandating um, um, translation and interpretation services. If you drop it down to 5 percent or even at 500 individuals, which is what we're lobbying for, then all 50 states are going to be involved. So there's a problem, and this problem um, can play out in many different ways. There's also minimal criteria for translation. So interpretation is oral and translation is written. And for uh, limited English proficient eligible groups of 10% or 3,000, you must translate and provide all vital, vital documents and documents available in multiple languages. So that is if 10% of your population or 3,000 individuals speak that language. If you have, uh, if you have 5% or 1,000, you must translate vital documents but can offer oral translation of other documents. And if you have groups of less than 100, you can provide written statements that oral translations of written materials are available. So these are kind of the rules. So again, I ask ourselves, is access enough? And what I want to do is sort of switch over and talk specifically about one population that really has uh, problems summarized by being both an immigrant, having hard, high numbers of limited English proficiency. So this is looking at the US population from 2000 to 2010. And what you can see is the fastest growing population is this one on the top, which is Asian American, followed closely by Hispanic. Um, and so this is a population that is rapidly growing in the United States. If you look at the percentage change in language spoken at home between 2000 and 2011, you can see at the very top of the list, again, is other Asian languages. You can see there's Hindi here, um, Gujarati, Chinese, Vietnamese, um, and here is Spanish. And you can see that this is, um, there are some languages that have gone down, Lao, Japanese, Polish, Yiddish, Greek. And so I think that there, this is, again, a population that is rapidly rising, and languages that are being spoken are often um, um, Asian languages. The other thing to think about is the proportion of, um, of the population that is um, limited in English proficient. So among all Spanish speakers, about 46% are limited English proficient. 
That's not the same in many of the Southeast Asian languages. So among the Lao, the Vietnamese, and Korean, many of these populations have 50, um, greater than 55 to 60, some, some up to 70% of their entire population that's limited English proficient. So again, you have a, a, lar a population that is in um, tremendous need of help. And certainly because the Asian population makes up about 5% of the US population, there's really going to be very few large counties that are going to have that 10% threshold that we're looking for. So in Illinois, this is, an, this is uh, looking at, there's about 550, about half a million Asian Americans in Illinois. We're the fifth largest state. Chicago is the sixth largest metropolitan um, city for Asian Americans. About 65% of all Asian Americans are foreign born. 80% speak another language at home. And compared to the rest of Illinois, which is about 10% limited English proficient, about 32% of Asian Americans, one in three, are limited English. The poverty rate for this group also varies by groups, but in aggregate, it's about 12%, which is higher than statewide numbers of about 9%. And the Midwest is really um, has some of the largest and most rapidly growing um, Asian American growth rate in the country. And I should point out that when we talk about Asian Americans, we are really lumping a very, very, a, a very um, non-homogenous group. These are some of the bigger groups, but again, there's over 50 languages spoken within um, this population. In terms of census um, 2010, looking at um, overall, the Chicago population dropped by 5% um, in the 2010 census. But if you look at Illinois, Cook County, and Chicago, uh, 2000 versus 2010, the Asian, um, Asian American population alone, you can see there was a 39% increase in Illinois, 24% in Cook County, and a 17% in Chicago. So these populations are really rapidly growing. If you think about the safety net system um, in, in um, Illinois and particularly in Chicago and you compare it to other states, we have about, um, again, looking just at Asian Americans, about half a million Asian Americans, and about 16.2% um, 16 of uninsured Asian Americans should have access to our safety net. Unfortunately, our safety net sees only about 1.4%. And HRSA recently reported that only one in five uninsured Asian Americans are receiving care at either community health centers or federally qualified health centers. And so we kind of wonder where the rest are going. And under Affordable Care Act, one of the things through the marketplace and looking at medical homes as well as coordinated care, many, many physicians that treat these limited English populations are actually in single solo practices. And under Affordable Care Act, that has become very, very difficult to practice given what you need to do in order to meet um, current guidelines and quality of care issues. And so this is a population that is really becoming abandoned. Um, in terms of the impact on um, Affordable Care Act, looking at insured pre and post um, ACA in Illinois, looking at these different populations, I just will tell you that um, post Affordable Care Act, we think that there'll be about 75,000 Asian Americans um, in Illinois who will be entering the marketplace. And what's interesting about this group compared to other racial ethnic groups, although small in number compared to the Hispanic and African American population, the Asian American population that will be entering under Affordable Care Act will have the highest percentage, that is 63% will be insured through the private marketplace compared to 50% among the African American and 56% among the Hispanic. So if you were a healthcare system, you might think that this is a po population that you want to um, accommodate. The problem is the healthcare system really has not, um, ha has, has real challenges in terms of serving Asian Americans. Um, Asian Americans stand out as being one of the least well served, and they're least likely to feel that their providers understand them, to be involved in medical decision making, and to have confidence in their provider. This is a study uh, from the Commonwealth Fund looking at the patient-physician interaction for Asians, and this is looking at great confidence in the doctor among those, among total adults, among English-speaking Asians and among um, those who are non-English speakers. And this is, about, this is having confidence in your doctor. This is being involved in decision-making about healthcare and that spent enough time with the doctor. And again, you can see the trend is if you don't speak English, and I would imagine this would be same, the same with any non-English speaking group. If you don't speak the language, you're not gonna have as much confidence or buy-in into the ability to care for your, your health. <coughs> So I want to turn it over a little bit and think about, um, of, about this place. So obviously, um, this is a CCD, and this is um, the University of Chicago. And think about 
um, what's happening on our own campus. So in terms of um, appealing to the leadership of this hospital to think about um, the need pr to provide equal access to care for Asian Americans, this is looking at the density of Asians um, in Illinois. Now, most Asian Americans are, live in one of four counties, Cook County, Will County, DuPage County, or Lake County. And you can see in this map what, where you see the red, um, reddish color, maroon color, that represents where, where that area has greater than 50% um, Asian Americans. So you can see that probably, this doesn't show up as clear as I'd, I'd like, but certainly in the air, areas around Chicago, that's definitely the case. And other areas, you can see that there is sort of a suburban migration of a lot of Asian Americans, particularly to um, um, outside of Cook County, and then also over into um, DuPage County. And if you overlay this, um, this, these areas that have high density of Asian Americans with some of our offsite provider locations, certainly this is uh, our hospital, University of Chicago, but this is where we have many offsite centers um, in the same um, squares. And so there is really um, a really interesting potential opportunity to start um, recruiting these individuals for healthcare within our own um, healthcare system. But we do have some barriers. This is even bringing it closer to home. This is Bridgeport, and this is um, actually um, Armour Square, which is Chinatown. Um, Bridgeport and then sort of areas around Chinatown. And you can see that um, in Bridgeport, which is really within sort of the south side um, reach of where our, we are, are focused on as a hospital, um, Bridgeport has 34% Asian Americans. And in fact, the community in Bridgeport now um, has, uh, the, the Asian population has surpassed the number of Hispanics in that um, community. And Bridgeport is the, la is the second largest um, um, Asian population now in Chicago. And this is a population that is really right next door. So again, I kind of remind us, what is the threshold for providing language and translational services under the Affordable Care Act? So again, I remind us that the, the, the rule is that 10% or more of non-English speaking individuals in a county. The problem is they have to speak the same language. That might be possible if you're a Spanish speaker. But if you're an Asian speaker, that could be very, very challenging. And this exempts um, limited English proficient access for almost every nonprofit hospital within 27 states because of the, the confines of this definition. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't apply to any of the hospitals in Chicago based on this definition. Versus what the Department of Health and Human Services require, which is a translation of vital documents when a language group is 5% or, or 1,000 individuals. And I would say that while race and ethnic, ethnicity data is very, very poorly captured, um, at our hospital, um, the data on Asian Americans we think may hover around 3%, although um, I think that that's probably not very accurate. So in some ways we have created what is a very perfect storm for health disparities among this Asian American population. We have a disproportionate um, burden of limited English proficiency. We're a very small but very rapidly growing population. In many ways within the healthcare system, we're not recognized as a minority. I mean, it's interesting. We make up 3% of the population. We're you know, a third of what, not even, a th we're maybe uh, less than half of, of the African American and Hispanic population. But because we don't fall under the underrepresented in medicine category, um, Asian Americans are often completely left out. Um, we are, have numerous subgroups, and so being able to address the healthcare needs of many, many subgroups would be really cost prohibitive. And finally, there's often a lack of interest or priority setting, um, especially on the south side, um, in, in addressing the healthcare needs of these um, populations. So let's think about our own faculty. Um, this is data from FAMIS, which is the AAMC, has a database of all faculty at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, apparently, I, I guess when I, whoa, sorry. When I started here, I must have filled it out, although I don't remember, so I'm not sure what I, I would answer. But it's a very, very comprehensive database. And what we, what, what, um, we looked at was um, the race, ethnicity, and language of, of individuals within this database among our you know, 900 or so faculty. And, and based on um, famous, we have about 21% um, Asian, Asian American. And that makes sense because about one in five graduating medical students now are Asian American. 
We have about 0.6 or 5 who fit in the category of Hispanic, which is um, incredibly low. Um, however, when you look at those who see patients, about um, 60 um, um, faculty that see patients reported that they speak um, an Asian language. And those Asian languages that are spoken are, are here on the side. And as you can see, there, there's, there's really a many, large number. But despite only having five that reported being Hispanic and famous, we have 70 individuals who speak Spanish on the faculty. Uh, many of them um, are also speaking these languages. And so I think the idea is that when you have a healthcare system and you're thinking about limited English proficiency, the capacity to speak a Spanish language in the hospital is far greater than our capacity to speak an Asian language, which is a real problem for individuals who come in. I just met with a faculty a few weeks ago who said that a patient flew in from Japan to come enter a cancer clinical trial, and in her ability to try to navigate the system was really not not able to understand eligibility criteria for that trial. So she flew in, she rented an apartment, she um, came to her first visit and found out that she was ineligible. And he says that she sat in his, her, his office for about an hour and cried, telling him how horrible this was, that she would actually go somewhere else that actually could speak the language. So I mean, I think it's a missed opportunity if we don't have an ability to, to interact with patients. This is, again, similar to um, um, faculty. If you look at, uh, this is the language spoken by uh, several classes ago, the Pritzker School of Medicine. And this large piece of the pie is Spanish. So even among our students, we have a really large uh, capacity to speak Spanish. Um, that's not the same necessarily for Asian languages. So who knows what this is? OK, what is it? So this is, uh, so how, how many, um, let me just see, how many physicians, um, how many people in the room are physicians who see patients? Raise your hand for a second. Okay, and how many people have seen this before? So it's interesting, so this is Marty, um, which is, um, this is, uh, sorry Marsha, I was thinking about you last night while I was trying to pull this together. So this is um, my accessible, okay, I, I had memorized this so many times, so let's see. My um, accessible, um, let's see, no, what is it? My, it it's, a, it's an interpreter. So it's uh, my, my accessible real-time trusted interpreter. That's what it is, Marty. My accessible real-time and trusted, uh, trusted interpreter. So at least in the, in the CCD, this is a computer screen that sits on um, sort of a, a cart. And when you have um, somebody that's coming in for a procedure, for instance, this is where we use it a lot in GI that need to be consent consented, you can dial up and you get actually a real person coming on screen and you just talk to each other. It's actually um, wonderful. And I think it would be wonderful if it was also available throughout the rest of the hospital. And I actually don't know what the cost is, but it's, um, it's wonderful. I think one of the big barriers for things like Marty and for other um, ability to work with limited English proficient populations is, as you may know, um, who pays for that? I mean, that, that comes out of the hospital pocket. So we have to pay for interpretation and translational services. This is not something right now that we are allowed to bill to insurances. And I think that this is something that we really need to advocate for if we want to be able to um, reach out to all populations. So this is Marty. And I think this is um, really very helpful. <coughs> but again, it needs to be disseminated across the hospital to reach all populations. And I see Mr. Joel Jackson here sitting, um, um, he's going to be leading our um, cultural competency program, so hopefully you'll get to know Marty really well over the um, coming years. Okay, all right, good, good. So I'm going to end by thinking about some potential s solutions. You know, I think that um, culturally and linguistically appropriate services are incredibly important. That is, not only that we provide language access, but that we are in an environment that is culturally competent. And I think that there is a big push under the leadership of, of um, Brenda Battle and the diversity and Melissa Gilliam with, under diversity and inclusion to really try to think about in a very thoughtful, strategic way how we are going to make this, this happen. There certainly needs to be a tremendous amount of education and awareness about these issues. And I think this education cannot stop just at the walls of our hospital. You know, I think that there needs to be much more bi-directional dialogue around community. 
and public health infrastructures. Because I think that we, we don't do a good enough job as well intentioned as we are if we don't involve the community. Now one of the things that, um, that the Asian Health Coalition, which in, uh, Marshall said, I am the president of this organization, nonprofit called the Asian Health Coalition. And one of the things that the coalition was able to do is to become an in-person counselor for the Affordable Care Act. The, the state had put together $28 million to be able to talk to communities that otherwise, to reach and access communities that might not be able to enroll in Affordable Care Act due to language or cultural barriers. And the Asian Health Coalition was one, the organization that was chosen to work with um, both the South Asian and the Lao community. And so this is um, one of the brochures that announced one of the informational sessions, this is in Hindi, um, talking about um, the Affordable Care Act. And I think this partnership has been incredibly important because I think that without the ability to go out into the community to teach them about the Affordable Care Act, you'll have access but you, that will not be accessed. And so I think this is important. And this is an example of, of what some of the training that took place in the coalition. This is a navigator training in, in Chicago. This is a Bhutanese refugee um, enrolling in Rogers Park. And this is one of the Laotian monks signing up um, in Kane County. And so I think that you really need to um, reach beyond our walls to make sure that we can bring individuals in. The other thing I think that's important is sort of the pipeline, and I've been thinking a lot about this pipeline. You know, I think that probably anybody knows who knows me at any meeting that I go to, that when we talk about minority issues, I'm always raising my hand and saying, well, what about Asian Americans? I'm like the militant Asian American. But I think that, you know, this pipeline is incredibly important to be addressed, to address the needs particularly of this population. And so I always tell Asian students, you know, I think that Asian students often, medical students often feel left out of the diversity dialogue conversation. They feel often that they're not really um, at the table. You know, they don't fit really into the white category category, they're not an underrepresented minority, their data often is reflected of the main, of sort of the Caucasian population, but they have many, many other barriers. And so I think that this is something that we really need to support this pipeline. I think the other thing, and we, this should be much better with um, under Affordable Care Act and with electronic medical records, is that we really need to have accurate data and accurate surveillance. I mean, I know even on collecting data on race, ethnicity, and language, I mean, we really need to do a more robust job in being able to have that information available, not only be for patient care and quality of care, but for research as well, because I think that drives a lot of the data that allows us to understand that there's differences in populations. And finally, I think that we really need to spend a lot of energy around policy and advocacy, and that is, um, particularly um, if you think specifically about li limited English populations, I think we really need to push to adopt this 5% or 500 LEP threshold for vital documents. I mean, it is unconscionable that you have patients come to us and they can't get care because they can't speak or read English. So I had a patient, um, and many of my students um, have probably seen this where I have the picture with my thumb with a big old piece of poop on it. And that is a picture that, I, that always reminds me what happened with the patient who we saw in the GI procedure on four separate, several, four separate times. He brought a ride in to get screened for colon cancer. He brought his instructions in every single time. He was a Spanish speaker. The instructions were completely only in English. He came every single time to his appointment with a ride, and every time was turned back because of poor prep. He had a poor prep because he never took the prep, because he never was able to understand those instructions. I mean, that should just not not happen. And we need to have a system that identifies and labels all limited English proficient populations so when they come in we can avoid this from happening again. I think we really need to also increase access to interpreter services. So I think Marty is wonderful. I think that as we try to make our hospital system more culturally competent, it would be very important to think about barriers to um, sort of organizational barriers to culturally competent care. It's usually not because anybody is trying to exclude somebody. It's just that sometimes it is what it is. So in the primary care clinic, and this may be different now, I know that we can often use language lines to, um, to talk to patients. That is that there's somebody on, the, on one end of the line, your patient is on it, so a three-way call and you're on there and you can all talk to each other. Not exactly the most personal way to talk, but at least that there it opens up a line of communication. And I don't know if this is still the case, I mean Marshall and Deb, you could probably tell me, but in primary care clinic, there are no phones in clinic, in the clinic rooms. Is that still the case? So you can imagine that if you have a patient that doesn't speak, there's phones in the hall. So if you needed to use a language line in primary care clinic, Joel, you should change this. 
you're going to have to stand in the hall. So, um, um, and Emilio's here too from, from um, international programs. So, I mean, I think that the responsibility is to make our organization um, capable of delivering um, culturally competent care. And I also think we probably need periodic language needs assessment checks. So we can make sure that we are, are delivering quality of care and in, in a way that, that is um, user friendly. So I don't know how many of you saw Claire Pomeroy's Grand Rounds a few weeks ago, but she used this slide and I thought, you know, when, I, when I looked at the slides before she presented, I had no idea what this meant. But somehow this slide has really resonated with me. This is the difference between equality and equity, and these are kids trying to look at the baseball game, and equality is when everyone gets the same stool. Um, you can see that these guys can't see, and equity is when you might have to give somebody a, an extra building block. And I, in order to, to have a, a fair, fair chance of seeing. And I think that this is really, um, you know, this is, I remember um, Emily was talking to me once and said, you know, this is a, an ethics conference, but, but where are the ethical que questions? So I guess this is my ethical question, is that, you know, for this very small population that is obviously um, in need of health services, you know, how do we go from equality to equity to make sure that we, we create the healthcare system that allows equ equitable distribution of healthcare? And I think that's our challenge. Thank you. Yeah. The discharge summaries and so forth. So, the next that's a really good question. Um, I know that a lot of the sort of documents um, you, you can get into many different languages in Epic, and so when you do your discharge planning, you can, you know, if it's constipation, you can do it in Spanish, you can do it in English, you can do it in several languages. But in terms of actually, can we take our plan and you know, in real time, get it um, translated. I don't think it has that capacity, although I think that the language capacity in Epic is probably much more robust than we might use. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's, a, that's a good um, question. So should we refer individuals back sort of to a, an area that has language capacity? Um, so, you know, there used to be a very large Chinese hospital in Chinatown which closed. Um, and I think that it's probably, I think in terms of thinking about access to healthcare, I think that we need to be ready as a healthcare system to provide um, access for all populations regardless of if they speak English and we need to be able to provide for them at our own hospital. So, um, you know, I think um, there are many individual practices, um, solo practitioners or very small group practitioners in among uh, many of the Asian communities. But I think they're also struggling under Affordable Care Act to make sure that their technology is up, um, is up to speed and that their quality of care is well documented. And so many of those solo practitioners have either joined forces, have joined hospitals, or have closed. And so I think that what we're seeing is that um, with you know, millions of individuals who fit both immigrant and limited English proficient populations coming into the exchange and marketplace and having access to affordable care, I think we are going to have to be ready for a much more diverse patient population and I think we it's our responsibility to do you know I, I think that's a good point and I, I think that there's probably you can, I don't think every healthcare system can have address every sort of language I mean I think there's 6,000 languages um, and so I think that there there are areas with within our surrounding hospital that have um, you know, there's a large Chinese community that may speak Mandarin, Cantonese, many other dialects of Chinese. And then there's large um, Hispanic communities as well. And I think that we have, we've done very, we've done better with in-house Spanish interpreters. Um, but I do think that we could, we could target, potentially target one or two sort of populations and make sure that we have resources available for those populations. And then everyone else would need something like Marty. But I know at hospitals that are, uh, some hospitals have exactly what you're describing, sort of that in the, um, uh, when you call, you can get many different language options. We just have not really done that uh, very well. Thanks for talking. Can you clarify or kind of talk about that a little more? 
Yeah, so that study looked at um, compliance or adherence with t handing in colon cancer screening. If you spoke, um, if your doctor was a Korean speaking Korean versus a non Korean speaking doctor with, a, with an interpreter. And without a doubt, the, the, the presence of a Korean speaking physician, at least in this small group, um, motivated individuals to be screened more so than those with an interpreter. And I think studies have shown that interpreter is better than no interpreter, but having a native speaker is always the best. And I think that's kind of what that study shows. So I wanted to talk about the case from the Japanese uh, visitor because we do have a good system for international patients. They all need to be flagged and sent to the international office and we coordinate and we have our own interpreters to make sure something like this doesn't happen. So my guess is that case probably someone got an appointment without going through the international office and that's how the system broke. In terms of domestic patients, we have a bigger challenge because it's a much bigger community and there's a bigger chance that they will show up without being properly uh, flagged. But there's several initiatives going on to improve these uh, systems. And currently, interpreting services falls under social services and uh, in the hospital. So they're outside international and we're trying to get better coordinated now. Yeah, and I, I think this international program is under Amelia Williams leadership is going to really grow beautifully and I think um, in terms of when we see patients I think that um, his group is really the should be the point of contact for all these individuals so they don't slip through the crack I would definitely agree sorry we have two more over here okay. I uh, like very much your picture of raising those who are short uh, uh, <laughs> But do we really have to bring the one who is taller, bring them down and shorten their spine? <laughs> so I think that's the, the, the so yeah, I don't think so. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I was a pediatrician volunteer in one public hospital here in Chicago. And I want to ask, uh, what is the level, the educational level of the interpreter? Because I want to ask a, a brief comment. Um, I listen to one uh, case, psychiatry case, in the clinical history, where the patient was with one uh, the interpreter. And the interpreter were translating what he uh, uh, belief, but was not the real issue that the patient has, and it was very, very, uh, it's a big problem. And the interpreter was no much, much primary level of education, and in the South America. Yeah, so I think that you bring up a really good point. Right now, we don't have a uniform certification process for interpreters. And I think that's um, sometimes you, um, and probably many of us who've worked with interpreters, sometimes you have people who are really great and professional and seem to have a very high level of competence. And at times, you, you don't have individuals like that. So you know, I had a similar experience. I worked with somebody who spoke a Chinese language. And she asked the interpreter to leave because she felt like her English was better than the interpreter's English. And so you know, that, that's a problem. And, and it's a problem from a medical legal standpoint and a documentation standpoint and you know as as healthcare providers we have the right to ask for interpretation interpretive services if we feel that we cannot communicate effectively with our patients and a lot of times our patients will say no 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 I don't need it because um, I can speak well enough and then as you're getting into the sort of the intricacies of of going over a health plan you realize that that actually the the language may be actually capacity may be much more limited so that's a good point yeah yeah, and that's so. the The problem she said was that the the interpreter was was probably undereducated or maybe not very well qualified. And and if you don't speak the language, you are really helpless and dependent on your interpreter, right, to be able to say the right thing. So that that's a problem. Thanks, that was really great. Um, do you think that it, this wouldn't be a solution for everybody? But um, speaking speaking to people from other cultures, it's not just interpretation. I think. Maybe it would be helpful for all of us to be a little bit better educated of how these cultures actually work. And maybe that's why interpreter doesn't add as much, because we don't have the background to understand where the patient's coming from. 
And you know, it took me a while to, you know, I, I use my fellows and everybody else that I can to tap into to know, you know, if, if we have a visitor from Saudi Arabia, I'm not going to shake their hand or actually even make an attempt to that. You know, which I normally wouldn't think about because you know that's not my cultural background. But maybe that is is the gap that the translates that would lift the translators help to a little bit better than where they are compared to native speakers. Yeah, so I think that's a good point. And, and actually, trained medical interpreters are also supposed to do cultural brokering. So if you um, do some kind of cultural faux pas, you know, which happens all the time, no matter how competent you are, um, they can tell you sort of what's going on. And I think, in, and if there is some um, 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 cultural piece that is perhaps interfering with communication or enhancing communication, the interpreter, the, actually real trained medical interpreters are supposed to help you with that. So not only navigate the language, but also um, navigate sort of some of the cultural norms that you may be violating in your interaction. Hi, I love you though. But, and this access thing is a real big problem, which uh, we usually are able to get interpreters in clinic and stuff. I find once you're beyond that, if you can admit a patient, especially take them to the operating room, it is a magnitude worse having them in the hospital, have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I just wonder if that's going to be at some point uh, your push to try to fix that as well. Because it's one thing just in the clinic, it's a, a bigger problem, although smaller numbers uh, when we have the patients in the hospital. Yeah, that, that's a huge problem. And, you know, I, I know I'm standing here talking about this, but if I'm rounding and there's somebody who doesn't speak English well, I might just go in there and sort of look at them and walk out, you know, because it's, it's not, the system is not easy for us to be able to sort of use language, um, uh, language lines necessarily, especially in the rooms we don't have two-way language lines, so it's, you, you know, you're handing back and forth. I think that's something that we have to think very carefully about how to how to address those issues because I think when I cover on the inpatient service I see a lot of actually um, on the liver service a lot of Spanish speaking patients and I feel like we don't have the capacity unless somebody on my team is fluent um, and unless or unless there's somebody else there who can, can help us through that process so I do think that as we're trying to create a culturally competent system those are systems things that we need to think about well, I have a question for you, Karen. Uh, you raised this issue of a culturally competent organization, and the title of your talk is Beyond Access, and clearly language is an important part. But in your vision, what does a culturally competent organization look like? When we look at the best practice hospitals in this area, what, what's, what's different, or what, what, what does it look like? So that's a, that's a great question. I think that um, um, an example of a really great, so first of all, I think you need to make sure that you have training from, the, from at all levels in terms of cultural competency training. And I think that's, that's the very beginning of, of, of what needs to be done. And I know that leadership now is really trying to bring people in, like um, Joel, to think very strategically about cultural competency training. And that's not just physicians, but nursing staff and, uh, and other providers. I think that um, the other thing that, um, in terms of thinking specifically about the Asian population, I think that, um, so I think tr that kind of training would be important. I think having access 24 hours a day to language access is incredibly important, whether those are in-house interpreters or whether that is access to language lines or if we have a ton of Martys. I mean, if you had a Marty on, uh, two Martys on every floor, I mean, those are actually very, very easy to use. And you can get almost any language um, available and you get a real person. So I mean, that would, that would be very, very important. I think the other thing is from, from top down, thinking about leadership from top down, we need to have, make sure that our staff and, and the people that, that work in this hospital are kind of reflective of the communities that we serve. And I think that kind of um, diversity in, in not only students, but faculty and staff are incredibly important. And I think that there needs to be, you know, very much from top down buy-in of, um, of constant education around the need for um, additional training and resources to make sure that we could provide um, both um, um, 
um, language and, and understand sort of cultural variations among, um, among groups without making assumptions. I think that there needs to be a tremendous amount of training on unconscious bias because I think uh, for, for many of you that have followed any of the work um, that was done around disparities and um, reported in the Institute of Medicine, unconscious bias, often we want to do the right thing and we have no idea that we are actually either um, saying um, comments that are disparaging or, or racist or that are, can be misinterpreted. So I think that we need to sort of know ourselves as well. If you give an example of a hospital somewhere like, you know, a, a community hospital like Mercy, they have a huge, they're, since they're located right next to Armour Square, their sort of idea of cultural competency is they have, they bring patients in, kind of what you were talking about, at sort of um, thinking about um, um, structuring resources um, for one particular population, they have on their day that they see uh, their breast clinic for Chinese women, they have um, every single person in that clinic is, is, speaks um, the, the Chinese, lang a Chinese language, from the nurses, from the front end staff, um, to the doctors. Now, that's not practical, right? So that's not practical, but what we can do is just make sure that we have not only providers that are, that are trained, but we have language resources and written resources as well. The other thing I would caution people who do procedures is that, you know, if you do a consent and somebody who doesn't speak English well and something goes wrong, you're very liable for, for, um, for a negative outcome. And so what, um, what Amelia said is that um, our social work I think under social services, our interpreters fall under social services. But I think that it would be very unwise to consent somebody for a procedure without having documentation that an interpreter was present for a non-English speaker. And what they do is if you know that you're doing that, they will bring, um, they will consent and then they will put on the consent form a sticker and a date and time saying that they were present and they were there during the consent process. And I really encourage people who are doing procedures to think carefully about using that resource because this could be a big problem going forward. Let's give a big hand for Karen. Thank you.